the topic is on dry eyes and contact lenses a very hot topic i would say many uh, workshops have been conducted on dry eyes and reports have come out so uh, my talk is going to be covering all about the pathophysiology of dry eyes and uh, the influence of contact lenses on dry eyes let us see what are the challenges about dry eyes and contact lenses are so to begin with 140 million people worldwide wear contact lenses for refractive error correction and this number has remained the same over the past decade and why is that so it, uh, so many innovations in contact lens materials and designs and uh, contact lens solutions yet the number has not risen which means to say that people are dropping out also from contact lens wear so statistics say that 10 to 50% of drop out of contact lens wear happens within 3 years of contact lens wear commencement okay and contact lens discomfort happens to be the leading cause for drop out the contact lens drop out cases and 40% of soft contact lens wearers reported dry eye symptoms which causes contact lens discomfort so in this slide you have kind of identified that uh, there is something which is happening beyond the contact lens design beyond the contact lens material or beyond the innovations in contact lens solutions which is causing people to drop out from contact lens wear and contact lens discomfort is one word which stands out on this slide so having said or mentioned about contact lens discomfort let us understand what is contact lens discomfort now tfos is the tear film ocular surface society this is headquartered in boston and this society was formulated in the year 2000 and they do extensive research in the field of tear film exclusively on tear film because uh, the research is based uh, on several you know workshops conducted on meetings and conferences all of it is hosted by the tfos uh, which is the tear film ocular surface society Uh, which says that the tear film is very important to protect the conjunctiva and the corneal integrity so any disturbance in the tear film will cause disturbances on the ocular surface and then lead to an ocular surface disorder so this society defines contact lens discomfort as a condition which is characterized by episodic or persistent adverse ocular sensations which is related to contact lens wear either with or without any visual disturbance which results from reduced compatibility between the contact lens and the ocular environment which can lead to decreased wearing time and discontinuation of the contact lens wear like in the previous slide it mentioned the cause for major uh, contact lens dropout was contact lens discomfort so we need to understand the terminology or what exactly is contact lens discomfort so there is this classification of contact lens discomfort people do come up to you with a uh, discomfort arising due to contact lens wear now you need to find out the cause for this discomfort now contact lens discomfort can be classified either a uh, contact lens related or the environment related so you need to identify what is causing this discomfort it could be a combination of both contact lens and environment also so what in the contact lens can lead to contact lens discomfort it could be purely material related based on the wettability of the uh, material or the lubricity of the material the water content of the material it could be design related uh, basically the edge design or the base curve or the generic design as such of the contact lens can lead to discomfort where uh, if you identify you need to change the design okay fit and wear related For example the lens um, interaction and as well as the modality of wear whether it is a monthly disposable or a, a quarterly disposable or a fortnightly disposable you need to identify what is causing and then you have to um, also give or provide the solution and also the care and maintenance part of the contact lens whether it is taken care of especially pertaining to the solution the chemistry of the solution the uh, contact lens care components that are involved which causes the discomfort you need to identify not everybody is compatible with a contact lens solution the particular contact lens solution sometimes you need to shift and juggle so contact lens if it's contact lens related you need to identify the source that is causing the discomfort 
as far as environment is concerned, it could be inherent patient factors like age, uh, gender, like um, uh, discomfort mostly is, you know, uh, females are more, are more prone to contact lens discomfort, uh, especially because of dry eyes, menopausal women, especially, and with increasing age, whether it is a male or a female, uh, as uh, uh, the age increases, the uh, cases of dry eye also increase, okay? And also any underlying ocular or systemic disease can aggravate a particular uh, uh, ocular environment or a situation which can lead to contact lens dis uh, discomfort. And certain modified patient uh, factors like, you know, uh, compliance related or medication usage or the ocular environment itself, the tear film components, there is a lack of some uh, element of the tear film that can lead to the contact lens discomfort or the external environment, like for instance, the work environment, if there is a very less of humidity, extreme windy conditions, all this air conditioned environment, all this can lead to discomfort whilst they are using the contact lens. Now looking at the bottom of this slide, uh, it shows the progression of the contact lens discomfort, which ultimately leads, uh, leads to a patient dropping out from contact lens wear. So initially the, uh, you know, contact lens discomfort starts as, you know, people struggling with wearing uh, contact lens or building up the wearing time because they are physically aware of the presence of something over the eye and that can also lead to visual disturbances like you know they're not too comfortable sometimes uh, the images appear blurry to them and they're not too um, you know uh, comfortable wearing uh, lenses for long hours and this causes uh, them to wear the contact lenses for lesser period of time and then uh, comfortable wearing time becomes less and then that results in reduced total wearing time and then what they do is they temporarily discontinue they wear it only on occasions instead of wearing it as a full time uh, they go for a part-time wear or you know temporary or occasional wear okay and then later on it results they become so uncomfortable that you know comfort takes a priority or vision takes a priority for them and they identify that this contact lens is of no use to them and thus uh, that will result in a permanent discontinuation of the contact lens wear so this is uh, the classification of contact lens discomfort and then how the contact lens discomfort leads to somebody dropping out of full time contact lens wear okay mm -hmm. now Talking about contact lens and dry eye, certain statistics which we are uh, need to be apprised about is contact lens wearers are at 2.38 times risk of developing dry eye than non-contact lens wearers. Contact lens wearers are 3.61 times uh, at higher risk of having severe dry eye symptoms than contact lens wearers. So all these are the results from studies and the studies have been quoted at the bottom of the slide. And the age to begin wearing contact lenses has been decreasing, which means younger population are uh, more uh, are wearing contact lenses more than the older population. So you need to look out for dry eyes even in younger population and not just specifically look out for the older people for dry eye related problems, either with regards to symptoms or uh, clinical dry eyes. And contact lens wearers, including high school students, are at risk of having dry eye symptoms. So that is the reason why I mentioned that uh, even in younger people, it's not that dry eye is predominantly for the older um, population. Even younger people are prone to dry eyes. It is not something which is age specific. Though with increasing age, the prevalence of dry eye disease is more. That doesn't mean that you ignore the younger population. And contact lens use was categorized as a consistent risk factor of dry eye disease. And this was reported by the uh, TFOS, the Tear Film Ocular Surface Society, in their DUCE report, which is the dry eye workshop that they had conducted uh, first in 2007. And the second report uh, was uh, recent, which was uh, in 2017. Okay. So we need to understand the pathophysiology of dry eye disease first before we move on to contact lenses and dry eye, right? So as practitioners, we all should be familiar with what dry eye is. For that, I would request that all of you, if you want to read up or know more about the uh, dry eye disease as such, you can go to the uh, Tear Film Ocular Surface Society website where they have uh, detailed reports on the um, juice workshop that they have conducted. And you can read the 
uh, summary of it though it runs to pages you can go to the basic summary they have you know very well summarized that so from the t4 dry eye workshop 2 i have picked up this uh, definition of dry eye disease you need to understand that dry eye is not a lone entity it is a multifactorial disease of the ocular surface which is characterized by a loss of homeostasis now what is homeostasis is something which maintains the balance if there is a tear film all the components need to be in the right balance as in the tear production and the tear evaporation there should be a good balance that is when the ocular uh, homeostasis is maintained and accompanied by ocular symptoms in which the tear film instability and hyperosmolarity now what is that term hyperosmolarity means it means there is an increase in the number of salt content present in the tear film and this leads to ocular surface inflammation and damage and neurosensory abnormalities which play etiological roles so you need to understand that dry eye disease cannot be treated as a lone entity it is a multifactorial disease which disturbs and causes a loss of the homeostasis of the tear film which is accompanied by symptoms sometimes you know you can encounter people who are asymptomatic but have clinical dry eyes that would be because of the preclinical stage they would eventually land up into a dry eye condition and there will be a uh, tear film instability and hyperosmolarity that is the um, hallmark of uh, dry eye disease i would talk about the entire pathophysiology of dry eye disease shortly in the coming slides okay so we we need to understand the definition of dry eye disease and the global prevalence of dry eye disease ranges anywhere between 5 and 50% and it is common amongst uh, contact lens wearers than non contact lens uh, wearers i will um explain why is it so in the coming slides and contact lens wear has been listed as a modifiable risk factor for dry eye disease okay and dry eye disease is a main cause for lens discontinuation and dropout worldwide remember the slide on contact lens discomfort so which is contact lens related if it is a main factor for causing the contact lens discomfort that eventually leads to contact lens dropout worldwide now this is the classification of dry eye disease when i say it's multifactorial you need to identify your patient when you have a patient who comes to you there can be two situations which arise from a patient either he or she is asymptomatic or he or she could be symptomatic talking about asymptomatic patients just follow the um, this is a busy slide so just follow the arrow where i'm pointing so when you encounter an asymptomatic patient if, when there are no signs obviously under the slit lamp you recognize no signs of a dry eye and everything is normal so there's no treatment required so when an asymptomatic patient walks in and you uh, observe signs of ocular surface disease that is signs without symptoms there could be predisposition to dry eye that is uh, you know the pre clinical stage i would say at that moment they may not be symptomatic but over a period of time this person would become symptomatic so you need to have preventative management strategy in a uh, stage which is appropriate you can you know caution them that these could be the probable symptoms that you could encounter and uh, you can um, have prophylactic treatment in place also and also there could be a situation where the patient is asymptomatic but neurotropic conditions that is there is a dysfunctional uh, sensation signs in uh, which indicate management of the dry eye disease which is required now moving on to a presenting patient who is symptomatic now the patient could be symptomatic now how do you say that a patient is symptomatic or asymptomatic you need to run an um, a dry eye questionnaire there are so many validated questionnaires that are available on the internet you can just download them you google for a validated dry eye questionnaire like an osdi or a deq8 and uh, you run that questionnaire from the questionnaire you can differentiate whether the patient is asymptomatic or symptomatic even if the patient is asymptomatic you are going to be observing the eye under the slit lamp so you can clinically uh, catch up on some signs of ocular uh, surface disease and if the patient is symptomatic on the questionnaire you look out for signs of ocular surface disease okay and then um, a series of uh, you know a protocol needs to be followed i will elaborate on this in the coming slides again so you ask for triaging questions and you 
identify that this is a case of dry eye disease. And also, if there are other ocular surface disease, you need to have a differential diagnosis protocol in place. So in that case, you refer or manage according to the differential diagnosis. Now, there could be a situation where the patient is symptomatic but has no signs. Under the slit lamp, everything appears absolutely normal. So symptoms without signs could also be a preclinical state. So you can observe and offer education or preventative therapy. Similarly, how you would deal signs without symptoms. You know, you have to deal them similarly. And also, it could be a non-ocular surface disease where uh, they are uh, having neuropathic pain because it is neurological in origin. So you need to refer for pain management because um, the cornea is a highly uh, sensitive organ with uh, extreme um, number of uh, corneal nerve endings uh, that you uh, see. So when that is affected, they will experience pain. And so pain management needs to be done. So here, when you say the patient is symptomatic, you see signs of ocular surface disease, the triaging question leads you to dry eye disease. Now, the sub-classification of dry eye disease is, uh, can I request all of you to keep your mics on mute? I can hear certain disturbances. Thank you. No, there are subtypes of dry eye disease. You can have an aqueous deficient dry eye uh, condition or an evaporative dry eye situation or a combination of both aqueous and evaporative dry eye. So whatever the situation, whatever the subtype be, whether it is an aqueous deficient dry eye or an evaporative dry eye or a combination of aqueous and evaporative dry eye, your management is to restore the homeostasis. Remember the first point that I mentioned that uh, the T-Force uh, DUCE report says that dry eye is a multifactorial disease which results in loss of the ocular uh, tear film homeostasis. So the balance is not there the tear production and the tear evaporation, there is an imbalance. So you need to restore the balance. That is the uh, your management protocol. So for that, to, uh, to efficiently manage a case of dry eye, you need to identify what is causing or what subtype of uh, dry eye disease this person has and then um, manage them appropriately. In our country, at least, like there is no fixed protocol. We do not really follow rules, right? We do our own thing. The minute patient says that, you know, I have uh, complaints of dry eye or you identify that this person has dry eye based on your Shermer's test or your tear breakup time, uh, immediate thing is artificial tears. Now, artificial tears also, you need to understand that not all artificial tears work for the patient. It, is, it might, you know, temporary, uh, give temporary relief to somebody. It might not work for somebody because artificial tears also are based on so many factors you need to identify which kind of artificial tears will help a particular person like for instance you have um, artificial tears which are water-based uh, for people who have aqueous and mucus deficiency, you need to look for an uh, tear, artificial tear, which is uh, water-based. And for somebody who has uh, lipid deficiency, you need to look out for you know, a mineral oil-based artificial tear okay so uh, that needs to be identified then you have uh, viscosity different viscous uh, uh, viscosity enhancing agents are placed in these artificial tears so higher the viscosity of an artificial tear better is the retention of the um, artificial tear on the eye now the uh, flip side of giving a highly viscous uh, tear film substitute is that it will blur the vision of the patient. So you need to identify whom you give what kind of artificial tear. Sometimes uh, uh, drops may not be sufficient. You might have to uh, ship them to gels or ointments. So you need to identify, do the proper workup, and then you be in a position to uh, you know, recommend an appropriate uh, artificial tears, not blindly say, okay, take a tear, um, artificial tear. Because it is available over the counter, we are too liberal in, um, you know, a kind of uh, dispensing or ordering them to um, go in for a artificial tear uh, drop. But you need to understand which kind of tear uh, film substitute will help for a particular person. So now don't get bogged down by this very busy slide. This is uh, to, for you to understand the dry eye mechanism. Okay, so just follow the arrow again. If you can follow my arrow mark, is this visible? Uh, Ma'am, if you can just quickly tell me if this uh, arrow yes. is visible. Yes, it is. Yeah. So just follow the arrow. Now what I'm showing, 
like I mentioned earlier, what is the hallmark of tear um, uh, dry eye? That is tear film hyperosmolarity. When I say hyperosmolarity, that means there is a sudden increase in the uh, salt content of the tears. We have all licked our tears sometime or the other or most of the times and you, you do find it salty, right? But that salt content, if the environment is such that the uh, salt content is higher than normal, then that could cause or trigger an inflammatory reaction. Now, what causes tear hyperosmolarity is evaporation. Now, evaporation happens day in and day out, okay? And it is a normal process. But increased amount of evaporation will happen when there is poor bling or uh, there is exposed interpalpable aperture, okay? When, and also with partial blinking and poor blinkers, uh, increased amount of evaporation happens. And also environmental related factors like low humidity, high wind speed, high temperature, all this can um, increase the rate of evaporation of tears. Like I told you, to maintain the homeostasis of the ocular environment, you need to have that the uh, tear production and the evaporation should be appropriate and should be at a balance. When there is an imbalance between production and evaporation, then that could lead to tear hyperosmolarity. Now, when there is increased amount of salt present in the tear, that will trigger, you know, inflammatory reactions. When there is a trigger of an inflammatory reaction, inflammatory mediators come on to the epithelial surface and they uh, kind of act on it. And that could lead to a goblet cell and glycocalyx mucin loss and epithelial damage. That is the epithelial apoptosis. Okay. Now, this will cause increased friction from loss of boundary and hydrodynamic lubrication. Now, once this occurs, that will lead to tear film instability. And that will also lead to tear hyperosmolarity. Now, you need to understand that tear hyperosmolarity predominantly happens when there is excessive evaporation of tears. But tear film instability can happen without the absence of excessive evaporation also. Like in conditions like there is a deficient or an unstable tear film of the, uh, especially the lipid layer or a vitamin A deficiency or any ocular allergy because of preservatives or due to contact lens wear, that could cause an instability of the tear film and that will trigger a tear hyperosmolarity. And this continuous cycle, this is a vicious cycle, this will keep going about. And that will cause a long-term, uh, you know, uh, defect of the ocular surface or lead to a dry eye disease. So this is the circle that you need to understand first. Now moving on to the subtypes of dry eye. Like I mentioned in the previous slide, you can have an aqueous deficiency dry eye or an evaporative dry eye. Okay. Now coming to aqueous deficiency dry eye, here there is a low flow. That is, there is decreased lacrimal secretion but the evaporation is happening at a normal rate, okay? Now, decreased lacrimal secretion can happen in n number of situations. It could be non joggins uh, dry eye, like keratoconjunctivitis sicca, or because of an aging process, low androgens can result in uh, low uh, lacrimal or equus production. Then uh, Jogren syndrome dry eye, which is an autoimmune condition, that can lead to uh, reduced uh, lacrimal secretion. Even any uh, lacrimal obstruction can lead to decreased uh, lacrimal secretion, any systemic drugs, especially um, antihypertensives, uh, that can also cause a re reduction in uh, lacrimal secretion and also post-refractive surgery or a contact lens wear or, uh, you know, uh, abusing topical anesthetic and excessive use of topical anesthetic can also cause a reflex block that will reduce the lacrimal secretion. So all of these factors can contribute to a low flow. In this case, the evaporation is happening normally, but there is generally a reduction in the aqueous secretion that leads to a, a hyperosmolarity condition. Okay, and this uh, cycle will follow. Moving on to the right hand side of the um, slide, it is evaporative dry eye. Now, what is evaporative dry eye? That is the excessive evaporation happening, and the most uh, predominant um, contributor to evaporative dry eye is our. <coughs> excuse me, mebomium gland dysfunction, okay? Now, when I say evaporative dry eye, so the lipid layer 
is the one which prevents or you know controls the evaporation of tears in a mebomem gland dysfunction the lipid secretion is less so when you uh, measure the lipid thickness uh, uh, in the tear film that will be uh, negligible or very thin so the evaporation happens quicker so because of excessive evaporation that will trigger a tear hyperosmolarity and then the ocular surface mediators the inflammatory mediators will reach the epithelial surface causing the goblet cell and the epithelial cell loss which will further uh, cause a tear film instability and then that leads again to hyperosmolarity and the uh, cycle continues also other factors like uh, anterior blepharitis and um, can trigger a uh, high evaporation and like i mentioned earlier deficient or an unstable lipid layer or vitamin a deficiency any ocular allergy all of this can lead to tear film instability leading to tear hyperosmolarity but when you talk in a broader sense both aqueous deficiency dry eye and evaporative dry eye are a form of evaporative dry eye only because evaporation is a major trigger to the hyperosmolarity of tears so a combination of aqueous and uh, you know evaporative dry eye situation also occurs in many of the patients but you need to broadly define what kind of uh, subtype of dry eye uh, this uh, person who has walked into your clinic has and then you will uh, go for the management okay i hope this slide is clear to all of you if there is any doubt you can always type in in the chat box i can come back and um, explain now this is uh, one study which i was uh, reading through literature if you see this was published on 25th of june 2023 just 4 days ago so uh, the purpose was uh, it was a, a kind of um, a review and meta analysis was uh, done to find the impact of dry eye disease on the corneal nerve uh, parameters just to highlight on the conclusion it says that uh, there is enough evidence of corneal nerve loss in dry eye disease uh, Uh, eyes particularly with semi automatic procedure okay that was one thing that they used but i want to just uh, highlight this fact that you know dry eye disease is being studied exhaustively and the tear film ocular surface society especially works uh, you know predominantly in this field so you can read up a lot on this and every day some new uh, research comes up and this meta analysis clearly points out that there is a corneal nerve loss in dry eye disease which you need to look into so coming to dry eye testing now by now you should have understood what dry eye disease is all about and what is the sub, what is the pathophysiology what causes the dry eye and what are the subtypes of dry eye having said that now dry eye testing is very important so what are the uh, tools that are needed to confirm the dry eye is what we need to see there are n number of uh, products equipment that are available now coming to the dry eye diagnostic test, uh, testing the subtype classification first you start with triaging questions triaging questions are leading questions which will help you kind of narrow down your diagnosis like for instance triaging questions could be how severe is the eye uh, discomfort do you have any associated mouth dryness or swoll uh, swollen glands how long have the symptoms lasted are the symptoms uh, or any redness much worse in one eye than the other do you wear contact lenses so all type of leading questions these are the, these are the triaging questions once that is been asked you suspect dry eye in that particular case so you need to have the risk factor analysis done like whether they are uh, using certain medications whether it is ocular or systemic medications and whether they are into contact lens wear now coming to the diagnostic test first you will run the dry eye questionnaire that is the symptomatic uh, questionnaire which is the dry eye questionnaire 5 uh, or the osdi ocular surface uh, dry eye index you you can run either of the validated questionnaires okay if that is done plus one of the diagnostic tests to check the homeostasis it predominantly we would uh, want that a non invasive tear break up time is done than the invasive one which is less than 10 seconds or um, only to be used uh, that is a fluorescein is to be used only if you cannot perform a non invasive tear break up time or uh, check for osmolarity okay it should be more than 308 milli osmols per liter in either of the eye or the interocular difference should be greater than 8 milli osmols and look for ocular surface straining 
just follow the arrow please don't uh, look or concentrate on the right side of the slide for now uh, look for the corneal and the conjunctival staining so basically to start with you ask some uh, triaging questions then you when you suspect dry eye then you do the risk factor analysis sorry okay and once that is done you run the questionnaire so you have the uh, results of the questionnaire with you and then if one of these tests are positive either you do a non invasive tear breakup time or an osmo uh, checking for the uh, tear hyperosmolarity or the ocular surface uh, staining okay many of us do not have the means to check for the tear uh, osmolarity but we can definitely do the non invasive tear breakup time and the ocular surface staining so if this uh, comes up positive or both turn out to be positive now you move on to the uh, subtype classification whether it is an evaporative dry eye or an aqueous deficiency dry eye how do you identify that i'm so sorry the aqueous deficiency uh, meaning that there is reduced secretion of tears okay uh, so that will have uh, the, how do you come to conclusion of that you look for the tear meniscus height so if the tear meniscus is less than 0.3 mm then they are having aqueous deficiency that is uh, if it's 0.2 mm if you measure 0.2 mm then it is mild case of aqueous uh, deficiency if it is 0.1 mm it is moderate aqueous uh, deficiency and if it is nil then it is a severe form of aqueous deficiency moving on to evaporative uh, dry eye so there would be abnormal lipid layer and an underlying meibomian gland dysfunction so you check whether it is mild moderate or severe again so mild would be when there is secretion and ex expressibility of one of the glands and the lipid uh, layer when you analyze uh, you notice color fringes moderate case of uh, evaporative dry eye would be when the there is a, li a lipid mesh work when there is expressibility of 2 to 3 um, uh, glands of the meibomian glands and then a uh, severe case of evaporative dry eye would be when there is a lid margin dropout or a displacement when there is more than 13 number of secretions expressibility in three or more glands and lipid layer is uh, close to non existent okay and then so once you have the subtype uh, classification or when you see that you notice that uh, the both the tear meniscus height is also uh, mild moderate as well as uh, there is a mild moderate uh, evaporative dry eye symptoms also that is a case of a mixed form of dry eye so having said that you need to identify the subtype and then move on to the management strategy okay so first let us find out how do you uh, establish whether the tear film is stable or not so you need to check for the tear film break up time so the tfos uh, especially tells that you look for the non invasive tear film break up time which if it's less than 10 seconds that it is indicative of a, a dry eye okay so when you are doing um, fluorescein break up it may not give you the exact value one it is invasive another is when you add fluorescein obviously you're going to be wetting the fluorescein strip so you're adding more solution to the already non existing uh, tear in uh, film environment right so it is better to avoid using fluorescein to check up for the tear break up time especially when you're suspecting a dry eye case okay now lipid pattern classification again uh, this you need to have the means to check for this not all of us are well equipped in our um, um, you know setups to look for the lipid pattern but uh, if you check for the lipid pattern if um, if it color fringes are there then it is mild then if there is a flow or amorphous pattern that you notice on the lipid layer then it is a moderate case of lipid deficiency and when there is an open uh, mesh work then uh, it is a severe form of uh, lipid deficiency okay and again uh, i told you tear film hyperosmolarity is the hallmark of dry eye disease if you have this tear lab with you where you, you can measure the osmolarity of the tears nothing like that because it is uh, um, it's like a gold standard for dry eye but uh, this is mostly uh, kept in dry eye labs exclusive dry eye labs across the globe and if you can have access to it nothing like that at least big hospitals do have access to these things but in private practice it is seldom used Uh, so this um, diagnostic criteria is when it is more than or equal to 308 um, milliosmoles per liter 
or when the inter eye difference value of um, greater than 8 um, milli or small per liter then it is confirmative of a tearful hyperosmolarity okay another one which you can easily do is the ocular surface staining so uh, staining this has to be mandatorily done for all your uh, dry eye suspect cases so you can uh, liberally use fluorescein and lysamin green lysamin green and fluorescein uh, a combination of both are used to check for the lid viper region and if you want to exclusively check for you know corneal uh, staining you can just use a fluorescein stain and look for a corneal a punctate spots if they are greater than five in number or conjunctival spots greater than nine in number ringa ringa roses ringa ringa roses can you just mute thank you so when there is a lid margin staining of greater than 2 mm in length or more than 25% of the uh, lid margin is stained, then it is indicative of a an, um, dry eye situation. Okay. These were all the tests that you ran for the evaporative dry eye. Now you need to, uh, if that is done, you also need to check for the equus deficiency. So the tear volume test, like the tear meniscus height, you can check for and uh, you can then classify whether there is a mild or moderate or severe case of equus deficiency based on the tear meniscus height. Other tests can also be done to check for equus uh, deficiency, which is in light gray, if you notice in this slide, which is the Schirmer's uh, test, which is uh, done predominantly actually. But again, this being an invasive test, the very fact that you are going to be touching the uh, ocular surface, that will uh, cause reflex tearing. So the actual, um, you the, the results are not real, okay? Their added basic reflex tearing will add up to the measurement. So you can't really come to a conclusion. Tear meniscus height is a better predictor of uh, equus deficiency. So for evaporative dry eye diagnostics, you need to um, examine the nebomium gland for expressibility and oil flow. So you have nebography or interferometry then you check for blink uh, and lid closure and lid margin keratinization and you classify uh, based on whether it is a mild case of uh, MGD or moderate or severe case of MGD to uh, diagnose whether it is a case of evaporative dry eye. Like I said earlier, you can have uh, patients who have uh, both aqueous deficiency as well as an evaporative uh, dry eye situation, a combination of both, then the management becomes different in those. When it is exclusively evaporative dry eye or exclusively aqueous deficiency, then you can, your uh, tar management can be targeted towards uh, uh, you know, uh, managing the ocular homeostasis by uh, targeting that particular area of the tear film. So to summarize the dry eye, you need to ask triaging questions. You do a risk factor analysis, find out if they are under any ocular or systemic medications or any contact lens wear. Then you, you suspect and you want to diagnose or confirm whether it is dry eye. You run the diagnostic test. You definitely run the um, symptomology questionnaire, which is the dry eye questionnaire or the OSDI questionnaire. These are validated questionnaires. Once uh, that is uh, done, you run the test to uh, assess the homeostasis, especially the uh, non-invasive breakup time, the tear hyperosmolarity, and the uh, staining of the ocular surface to check for any um, stains on the cornea, the conjunctiva, or the lid margin. Okay, and then you identify what subtype of dry eye uh, this person is under, whether it is evaporative dry eye or an aqueous deficiency. Aqueous deficiency simply uh, look at the tear meniscus height and classify whether they are mild, moderate, or severe case of aqueous deficiency. And in order to confirm whether it is an uh, evaporative dry eye, then you uh, run the other test. Okay. So coming to the management, now I'm not going to go into the details of this because we are going to be running short of time. I need to cover uh, contact lens and dry eye. So this is freely available uh, and this I have taken from IACL uh, resources, but you can uh, go to the TFOS um, website and you can get all the information. So step one, step two, step three, step four are the steps that you will follow. If step one, you have uh, educated regarding the condition or uh, done some environmental modification and uh, you know uh, advise them on lid hygiene or warm compress if it is a case of MGND, MGD and it has not worked then you move on to 
uh, step two, which might uh, have a punctal occlusion or moisture chamber goggles or spectacles that are recommended, or you can give topical and antibiotic, of course, co-managing with the ophthalmologist or top, uh, topical secretagogues. Secretagogues will increase a particular content of the tear film. So you need to identify if it is an equus deficiency, then you uh, identify eye drops, which are equus uh, secretagogues. And if it is lipid deficient uh, tear film, then you have, um, you know, uh, tear drops, which are uh, lipid secretagogues, which will increase the lipid production in the eye, okay? And if the step one and step two doesn't work for a particular uh, patient, then you need to go move on to step three, which will uh, in, uh, include oral secretor gogs or soft bandage lenses or rigid scleral lenses. If all these three don't work, then you might have to go in for topical corticosteroids or amniotic membrane graft or surgical punctal occlusion. So this is the way or the protocol that is to be followed. You first need to understand the pathophysiology of dry eye you run uh, the uh, proper uh, diagnostic testing evaluation is very, very important. And you uh, classify whether they are an uh, equus or an evaporative dry eye case and then management according to what the subtype is. Now coming to the important topic of uh, today, which is contact lens and dry eye. Now you need to understand there are two things. One is the contact lens induced dry eye and the other is contact lens associated dry eye. Clyde and CLAD. Today, I'm going to be concentrating only on Clyde, not on CLAD, because in Clyde, what happens is the patient becomes asymptomatic after contact lens removal, which means the dry eye is because of the contact lens wear. He is symptomatic only when wearing the contact lenses. As long, When the contact lenses are not on the eye, the patient is asymptomatic. Whereas in CLAD, contact lens associated dry eye, the, it is actually a pre-existing dry eyes and the symptomatic regardless of the contact lens wear, whether the patient wears contact lenses or doesn't wear, he is symptomatic, okay? So coming to Clyde, the contact lens induced dry eye, the prevalence ranges anywhere between 15 to 55% and variations in this prevalence is because of the study population, the contact lens material that was used in the study or the diagnostic criteria that was used to uh, confirm and also the clinical tests that were run. So the risk factors for contact lens induced dry eye could be, again, many. It could be contact lens related factors, or it could be environmental factors or patient related factors. Now, contact lens related factors is uh, you see Clyde more often in a soft contact lens uh, user than on a rigid gas permeable uh, user. More so in hydrogel lens wearers than silicon hydrogel because of the water content of these hydrogels, there, there is um, quicker uh, evaporation of tears. Uh, also high water content lenses, poor wettability and increased wearing time uh, are uh, risk factors uh, for light. Environmental factors, increased temperature with reduced humidity and prolonged use of visual display units are a risk factor for light. When it comes to patient-related factors, like I mentioned earlier, also females are more predisposed and Asians, again, are more predisposed to uh, uh, contact lens-induced dry eye. In uh, RGP contact lens um, wearers, three and uh, nine o'clock straining um, are predominant and also a corneal delin, whereas in soft contact lens wearers, you will predominantly see an inferior closure staining. Dry eye-related you know, staining is, uh, ma'am, can you please mute? Yeah, inferior closure staining is again a hallmark feature of dry eye because uh, these people are partial blinkers, especially with uh, soft contact lens wear. Now, we need to understand what is causing, what is causing uh, the um, dry eye in contact lens wearers. So if you see the image to the left, this is the tear film thickness. And when you insert a contact lens, a soft contact lens, what happens is it splits the tear film. So you see this, uh, follow the arrow, the soft contact lens, approximately 70 microns. It, it kind of splits the tear film into the pre-lens tear film and the post-lens tear film. Whereas this uh, tear film without the contact lens, you see the thickness as against the uh, tear film thickness here when you introduce a soft contact lens. So this is the reason for the dry eye development because of the splitting of the tear film. So also there is changes in tear composition during a uh, lens wear. 
So a lipid layer thickness gets reduced. There is lower concentration of phospholipids. There is lysosome uh, con uh, content is not affected though. There is higher concentration of prolactin induced protein in dry eye patients. And then there is higher uh, concentration of IL-8, which is an inflammatory mediator. Remember the slide where I said, because of tier um, hyperosmolarity, the inflammatory mediators come to the surface of the epithelial uh, layer of the cornea and they damage the epithelial cells and the glycocalyx and the goblet cells. So the inflammatory mediators are higher in concentration uh, during contact lens wear, and also the mucin layer becomes thinned out with contact lens wear. So talking about the mechanism of Clyde, the core mechanism of Clyde is the partitioning of the tear film both into pre and post contact lens uh, films, okay? Tear film thinning and a decrease in the overall tear volume and its stability. So this causes an increased evaporation of the post-contact lens tear film and decreased contact lens and ocular surface wettability. So this triggers or causes a tear uh, film hyperosmolarity and ocular surface inflammation. Remember that cycle. So Clyde may also be associated with increased meibomian gland dysfunction. So the symptoms of Clyde are reduced visual activity, foreign body sensation, typical of any dry eye case, you would say dryness, eye strain, blurred vision, discomfort. When you talk about signs, there is reduced tear breakup time, decreased uh, TMH because predominantly it is associated with uh, meibomian gland dysfunction also. There would be epithelial, uh, corneal epithelial staining, there would be increased blink rate, tear hyperosmolarity and ocular surface inflammation. Now, what are the differential diagnoses of Clyde? Obviously, it is CLAD, which is contact lens associated dry eye. That is, they would be symptomatic even without the contact lens wear. But in Clyde, the patient is going to be symptomatic only with contact lenses. So you need to identify whether it is Clyde or CLAD first. Then contact lens discomfort because of whether it is uh, contact lens related or environmental related, the first uh, table that I showed. And um, if it's predominantly meibomian gland dysfunction, then you need to address the meibomian gland dysfunction and then uh, ask them to resume their contact lens wear. And any ocular surface uh, conditions like demodex, lepritis, CLPC, and any allergies, that needs to be addressed. So what are the diagnostic tests to assess Clyde? Basic general medical history, ophthalmic history, and risk factor identification, just the way you would do a dry eye uh, analysis protocol. Subjective assessment is you need to run a validated questionnaire, uh, a CLDEQ8 or an OSDI. Objective clinical assessment is a staining of the cornea on the anterior segment and you check for the corneal assessment and conjunctival assessment. In the corneal assessment, like I mentioned earlier, you see the interior uh, cornea gets stained predominantly in dry eyes because of improper blinking and exposure. There is desiccation of the um, corneal epithelium that uh, causes the stain. And in the conjunctiva, you could notice lit parallel conjunctival uh, folds, which is again a classic uh, symptom, uh, sorry, sign of dry eyes. Now, evaluation of tear film, you need to assess the tear film composition by osmolarity testing or tear film ferning testing. Now, what is tear film ferning testing? You observe the tear film under the microscope. The uh, picture over here to the left, the A is uh, how it appears in a normal tear film. Whereas in a dry eye, they will all be disrupted. This is a pattern that you see typically in dry eye tears under the microscope. For tear film volume, you assess the tear film height. For tear production and secretion, you can um, run the Schirmer's test or the phenol red thread test. For tear film stability, check for the tear breakup time and the uh, non-invasive tear breakup time. Check for non-invasive breakup time for the tear film stability. Assessment of lipid layer thickness by interferometry or tear scope. And ocular surface evaluation, you do the corneal and conjunctival staining. So assessment of uh, eyelids, you'll check for the lid viper region for lid viper epitheliopathy by using lysamine green and um, fluorescein. And there is a grading scale, COPS grading scale is available. You need, just like how you would use uh, the BHYI or the CCLRU grading scale, you need to, um, you know, um, apply these uh, dyes on the eye and check for the lid viper region for any epitheliopathy and grade them accordingly. And assess the meibomium glands 
and check for any dysfunction and also assess for blink rate and completeness. Blink rate may be normal, but the person could be a partial blinker. So you need to uh, notice whether, they are, whether it is a complete or a partial blink. So if you have access to laboratory assessment, you can do a quantitative assessment of inflammatory biomatri uh, biomarkers, especially the uh, matrix metalloproteinase, MMP9, cytokines and chemokines, which are the inflammatory biomarkers which are present in the tear film of dry eye cases, and also assessment of use and function and goblet cell density, and you could do an impression cytology. So how do you manage when you identify that this is a con case of a contact lens induced dry eye, you need to treat pre-existing ocular surface disease if present. Then you need to have a tailored or a customized treatment, a treatment protocol which is aimed to restore the homeostasis of the ocular surface and normal tear function. Therapeutic approaches are proposed for dry eye disease in non-contact lens virus, which can be used for Clyde or as well, specifically to target the subtype of uh, dry eye disease, whether it is an aqueous deficiency dry eye or an evaporative dry eye. And treatment targeting the tear film or the contact lens. This was developed by the uh, Japanese Dry Eye Society. So they identify if the particular layer of the tear film is a uh, deficient then they uh, the treatment will be uh, directed towards uh, you know increasing the secretion of that component of the tear film or if it is contact lens related then they work either on changing the design or the material or the edge profile so like treatments targeting the tear film treatment modalities are characterized according to noted deficiency in each layer of the tear film whether it is aqueous deficiency lipid deficiency or mucin so you can't really pinpoint a mucin deficiency as such it could be an aqua mucin uh, combination which is deficient like i said earlier artificial tears are you know um, prescribed rep right and center without knowing that uh, there are different types of artificial tears you need to identify that if there is a muco aqueous layer deficiency you need to um, you know offer demulsants which are carboxymethylcellulose or hyaluronic acid based artificial tears and uh, if it's a lipid layer deficiency then you can give um, you know artificial tears which are mineral oil based um, uh, which are called emollients okay so you need to check on each of the artificial tears what is whether it is water based or oil based and what the patient has whether there is an aqueous deficiency or a lipid deficiency Efficiency and offer that appropriate artificial tears. Otherwise, the giving refreshed tears to everybody may not really work. I'm just quoting an example. I'm not taking uh, brands as such. So treatments targeting the contact lens is, uh, like I said, the risk factors, hydrogel wearers are more prone to Clyde than silicon hydrogels. If they are hydrogel wearers, then ship them to silicon hydrogels or uh, ship them to contact lenses with higher wettability or applying wetting agents like uh, polyvinyl pyrolidin or polyvinyl acid or surface by uh, hyaluronic acid or switching to daily disposables if uh, the case is acute. Scleral lenses may improve symptoms of dryness in patients with pre-existing dry eye disease and uh, contact lens associated dry eye. So this is... Uh, with it and prevention of Clyde is contact lens uh, wearers with dryness symptoms should be informed about Clyde. They could be predisposed to a contact lens induced dry eye. So that is the, why your pre-fit evaluation becomes very, very important. You need to identify much earlier rather than them coming to you with a contact lens induced dry eye. You can easily identify whether there will be a predisposition to a case of Clyde. You can identify if your pre-fit evaluation has been done thoroughly when you have used all the adequate uh, dyes to, you know, check for any corneal or conjunctival staining or the lid viper region for epitheliopathy because even non-contact lens wearers uh, do have lid viper epitheliopathy and corneal and conjunctival staining. If they already have that, then um, adding a contact lens will only aggravate the situation. So you can prevent that. Or if there is a pre-existing nevomium gland dysfunction and you're adding a contact lens over the eye, it is only going to aggravate that. So you first have to treat what is pre-existing. And once that is resolved, then you recommend for a, a contact lens. So these are my resources. Mm -hmm.